Okay, we're in uh, the eighth file of the 22 files in Psalm 119. Now remember, a file is just one of the 22 systematic categories in uh, the uh, word that we have here in this particular portion. And the eighth file, or the eighth Hebrew word, is heth. And it's H-E-T-H, or it could be C-H-E-T-H. And this particular word is symbolized as an enclosure or a fence or a walled fortress. So we have to keep that in mind as we are studying this. And that makes the first part of verse number uh, 57 uh, makes the, uh, much more sense when we read, Thou art my portion, O Lord. I have said that I would keep thy word. Now, the word portion is kalak, C-H-E-L-E-Q. And again, as we said, there are 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and Ezra, the writer of this psalm, gives eight verses of uh, each of these particular um, uh, files, eight verses dedicated to one particular Hebrew letter. Now, taking this word with the symbolism of the letter, we find, Thou art my portion, O Lord, to be Ezra's defense, or his inheritance, or his designated uh, allotment in eternity. And that, of course, is what it's alluding to. But he's also talking about the fact that he is in the midst of enemy territory. People are hostile against him. And uh, despite that, God is the one who is surrounding him and protecting him. Thou art my walled city. Now, not only that, but uh, this particular portion of Scripture and the word portion has to do with that of destiny. When somebody was the eldest son of a man or any uh, of his children, they would receive a specific allotment. And of course, when the father died or when they got old enough, they would receive that particular portion. Now, in this case, Ezra recognizes the grandest allotment of all, a portion of God or a proximity to God. Thou art mine inheritance, O Lord. I have said that I would keep thy words. I entreated thy favor with my whole heart. Be merciful unto me according to thy word. Literally grant me a portion of thyself as you promised in your word. So the Hethphal literally says that God encompasses round about those that are mature believers, those that keep looking to Him, and God is going to protect them. But not only that, that blessing in time is going to be parlayed into a greater blessing in eternity when as an inheritance they receive that portion close to God that He has promised them for doing what He asked them to do during time. So the Heth foul is an extremely important foul. It means a walled city or destiny. Thou art my portion. You're my protector in time. You're my destiny in eternity. Now, the next portion that we want to look at is called the Teth foul. The Heth foul takes us from verse 57 to 64. And as we said, eight verses are devoted to that particular letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Ezra is remembering basic doctrine through doing this. This is his particular system, memory uh, system. And the ninth, from verse 65 to 72, is the Teth file. Now, the Teth word or letter in the Hebrew alphabet has to do with a relationship concept. So when you use the word or the letter teth, you're talking about maintaining a relationship with somebody. And so it starts off with verse number 65, thou hast dealt well with thy servant. And it is the Hebrew word, the thou hast is tob, again representing the letter teth. 
And tob means to make good or to grant and sustain a favorable relationship. The words dealt well is actually asa, A-S-A-H. And it means to make something out of something. Now we put them all together. Thou hast dealt well with thy servant. In other words, this particular servant has been faithful in learning the word of God. Now he has the uh, raw products that are needed. These raw products are taken and placed into his human spirit. There they form a frame of reference so that he has an understanding of life. He has capacity for life. He knows what to do in every situation. Now God places him in uh, adverse circumstances and prosperous circumstances. And whether it's in prosperity or adversity, whether he's rich or poor, whether somebody's persecuting him or he's uh, living in relative good times, it doesn't matter. He draws from this source of doctrine, from this frame of reference, and he brings it to the frontal lobe where he thinks and he puts life together. And this particular type of activity is what sustains his relationship with God. And so therefore, uh, he says, you've made something out of something. I have given you the raw materials, and now you have made me a man of God or a woman of God. You have brought to pass those things that you've promised. And that is what the teth vow is all about. A sustained relationship with God. Now, uh, we have known this as the R formula. Now, what is the R formula? Basically, you receive the Word of God, and then you bring it into your human spirit, and you inculcate it. Then you bring it out into your right lobe, where it is uh, transferred according to the frame of reference of your life. And then you take it and you reproduce it in your life, whether it's thought or whether it is uh, doing a certain action that is pleasing to the Lord. And so the teth vow has to do with sustaining a relationship with God, making something out of something. Now, what is the something that he makes? It's the image of Jesus Christ. What is it? I'll tell you what, it is extremely warm in here. I, uh, I, I told them to, um, uh, or they asked me to turn up the heat, and it was 72. And uh, they asked me to turn it up to 74. And every time it gets, it gets hot, my brain does not function because I've got the coat on and uh, the, the so forth. And okay. It is, it is extremely difficult to think when it is so warm. Verse number 65, again, well, let's, let's regroup here. Here is the concept. You have a relationship that you have, uh, have received by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. But you need to sustain that relationship by living in the Word. The Word is the raw material out of which God makes something. And what He makes is the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. You've made something out of something. Now, the concept of making, making something out of nothing is salvation. We do not have a human spirit, and once we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we are regenerated. And so God makes something out of nothing. We don't have a human spirit. He regenerates our human spirit. He gives us one. But now this concept is, I'm going to sustain a relationship with God. So God, therefore, has to make something out of something. And that something is the Word of God. You need to take in the Word of God each and every opportunity that you can. Put it in your human spirit, inculcate it, so when the opportunity arises, you can bring it forth from your human spirit. As we studied in the R formula, the cow has a four stomachs and he chews the cud and he literally brings it up again. He regurgitates it, that's the concept. He brings it to mind and it's the appropriate thing and that sustains the relationship with God. So the teth vow talks about that. All right, let's move on to number 10. This is the yod file. 
Y-O-D. It goes from verses 73 to 80. It can also be spelled J-O-D, but it's pronounced like the Y. Yod file. Well, what is the yod? The yod is the open hand as opposed to the closed hand or fist. That's why it immediately starts off with, Thy hands have made me. Also, the yod is the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Jesus called it a jot in Matthew 5.18. The jot and tittle, it is the smallest letter. So therefore, putting this with the word hand together or open hand, it means you have made me the way that I am, as small as I am, as helpless as I am. But you have made me for a purpose. Thy hands have made me and have fashioned me. What is the purpose, therefore? Give me understanding that I might learn thy commandments. I am helpless without you, God. I need somebody aside from myself, apart from myself. Now, we're familiar with this sort of concept because of the country of Kuwait. Kuwait was overrun by a bully. They had a million man army. They had tanks and weapons and guns and so forth. And they came in and just simply in a matter of hours whipped up on this particular nation. So Kuwait looked to a power beyond itself to recover its property and its territory. Now that is exactly the same concept that we have here. Lord, I'm small, I'm diminutive, I'm powerless, I'm helpless. But your hands have made me so for a purpose. What is that purpose? So that you can display your glory in me. Did not the Apostle Paul say that God has made the small things, the base things of the world, uh, greater than the things that are wise and beautiful, so that indeed he might bring to naught those things that think they're something. So the word hand means that God has fashioned us in this way so that we are utterly incapable of doing anything apart from him. And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ said, without me, you can do nothing. All right, let's go on then to the 11th Hebrew word. It is kaph, C-A-P-H. And the next eight verses are dedicated the next eight verses are dedicated to this particular file. What is the calf? The calf is the hollow or palm of the hand. So from verse 81 to verse 88, we have the hollow or palm of the hand. Now, taking this particular uh, symbolism and adding it to the word fainteth, that's actually the word that the verse starts off with in the Hebrew. It is kalah, K-A-L-A-H, and it's just simply a trans uh, formation there of the C into the K into the English to help us know its pronunciation. So it's kaf, or now we have kalah, and it means to completely consume as life's energy or to be depressed. Now, Note, if you will, verse number 81, the word faint. My soul fainteth for thy salvation, but I hope in thy word. This is a word for depression. Now, I want to talk about this for just a, a moment as uh, it is brought up here naturally in the scriptures. There is both a right and a wrong depression. One of Paul's uh, pastor friends was very, very depressed because he was apart from his people and uh, he was not able to minister the word to them as he thought that he should. And so he got depressed. And the Apostle Paul did not rebuke him for his depression. That, the, that simply points out that there is a right and a wrong depression. Depression can be a mental attitude sin. 
And there are some folks that are extremely negative in life. They're just that way naturally. And they tend to gravitate toward uh, the negative. Woe is me. Everything is wrong and so forth. But then there's a right kind of depression. And here we have the right kind. When Ezra had literally exhausted his life's energy, he emptied his soul to his people, he emptied his soul to God, there wasn't uh, any response from the people, and he thought that God had simply abandoned him. And so therefore it says, my soul is like the, the palm of a hand that is cupped, it is depressed. It is empty, God, do something for me, fill me up. And so therefore he does. I hope in thy word. Mine eyes fail for thy word. When wilt thou comfort me? How many are the days of thy servant? When wilt thou execute judgment on them that persecute me? And then again, note verse number 88. Quicken me after thy loving kindness, so shall I keep the testimony of thy mouth. Now the word quicken me in this particular case is fill me up. God, if you want me to function accordingly, God, if you want me to function correctly, you need to fill up the void in my life. Now there's several ways that God does this. First of all, of course, he fills up the empty void of the human spirit when we're saved. Next, he fills up the void of an empty uh, um, thought compartment when we're filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he keeps on filling us as we cycle the Word of God from our thought process into the human spirit back to the frontal part of our soul. All right, let's move on. Three more words that we want to talk about. The next file is the Lamed file. And it starts from verse 89 to verse 96. Lamed is L-A-M-E-D. What is a Lamed? Lamed is an ox goad. And it's a stick with a very sharp point on it that gets the ox going whenever it decides to bulk just a little bit or it decides that it wants to do something other than what the master wants it to do. We're going to find here that the ox goad is the word of God settled in heaven. And we're going to find out just how that works here in, in a moment. The word forever is the Hebrew word olam. Now again, we find that the eight verses are dedicated to one Hebrew letter, and this is Lamed, and we find Lam in this word, Olam. And Olam is cyclical. It means to conceal something around the vanishing point. Now, uh, whenever um, uh, Jim uh, Shopton and I went down to a certain evangelist school down there in Louisiana. Uh, we looked, and he had a great, great big gymnasium. It was first class. There are millions of dollars uh, placed into that building. And uh, what it had was a circular track but that had walls on it so that you couldn't see around the bend. And the way that you kept time, uh, because you were not able to see a clock, was that it had certain flashes of the uh, strobe lights uh, overhead, and you just simply kept your pace and your time with these things that were overhead for you because you could not see the clock and you could not see behind the turn in the bend. There was a vanishing point there. And God, or forever, or eternity, is just like that vanishing point. You get to one point and you can't see the end because there is always that bend there. So there's the cyclical or circle um, involved in this particular concept. And it says, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. What goes around comes around. If you leave the word of God at this particular point, the word of God is fixed and settled. God is going to somehow goad you with that or, excuse the expression, get you with his justice for disobeying his word. Now, the Apostle Paul talked, to, uh, or actually Luke, recorded for us the goading of the Apostle Paul. Jesus Christ came down, Paul was 
absolutely persecuting the Christians at that time. And Jesus said, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. The pricks were the ox goad into the conscience. Now, how does the word of God goad? The word of God gets into our conscience. Here was a man, Ezra, who was full of Bible doctrine. He knew when he was out of fellowship. He knew when he was in. He knew when he was in flesh four. He knew when he was in flesh five. And when he was in flesh four, the lights came on and he began to hurt in the realm of his conscience because he knew that if he was going to ever please God, he had to conform to the word. God doesn't conform to us. We conform to him. And when we do not conform, if we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, it goads us. It's settled. We need to conform to it. And so that is the Lamed file. And uh, that's why he says in verse 90, Thy faithfulness is unto all generations, because the word of God is the same, and uh, it was the same for them as it is the same for us, except dispensationally considered. All right, two more verses, two more files, rather. Now we're going to go to the MAME file. And this is from verse 97 to verse 104. What is maim? Maim is water. Now we've seen the capacity of water in the camel. But maim itself is water. And again, it starts out with this Hebrew letter. The word O is M-E-H, meh. And it's a question. Now, a poet wrote a poem that says, How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. We sing the song, Oh, how I love Jesus. And that's what this means. It's an interrogative. It's a question. Oh, how I love thy law. Or literally, how do I love it? Let me count the ways. Now, He's going to tell us exactly how he loves it in the next part of the verse. It is my meditation all the day long. Now we learned another technique concerning the Word of God. And it just shows how much you do love the Lord Jesus Christ. Your relationship to the, to the Word of God is your relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. And often your sustained relationship to the pastor-teacher is your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it's the pastor who teaches the Word, and the Word is what you orient your life around to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. And we learned two techniques. We called it the filling technique and the flushing technique. And that is the word meditation here. How do I love thy law? Well, I'm going to keep myself pure by the washing of water by the word. I meditate on it and I bring it in and a bad thought comes in and I wash the bad thought out. And again, the cycling concept of bringing doctrine to the forefront, appropriate doctrine, pertinent doctrine that meets the need of the hour. You must think Bible doctrine throughout the day. Bible doctrine is not to be uh, tolerated just a, a few moments during a Sunday morning service, and then you go out the door and live the way you want to. It's my meditation all the day, but literally, it's my function all the day. I fill my soul with it, and I wash out the bad with the Word of God. And therefore, it says in verse 98, Through thy commandments thou hast made me wiser than mine enemies. The enemies are ones that place the bad thoughts in the mind. All right, that's the main foul. How do I love thee? Constantly, I fill and I flush. I fill and I flush. I wash out. I bring in the clean and wash out the impure in my soul with the word of God. All right, one more file. And this is the nun file. N U N. Brother Jim Shackelford one time had uh, the Hartley's guest on, on whenever he had the correspondence course, and her name was Nancy Nunn. 
And he would always say, I've got a nun that's taking the correspondence course. Um, and he did. A nun, N-U-N, is a fish. Now, in verse number 105, we're going to see this word along with another one that gives us a concept of escaping temptation through the Word of God. So what did he do if he wanted to learn how to escape temptation? What was he going to do? Well, it says in verse number 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. But before we talk about feet taking us from anything that is vile and evil, we have to understand that the two uh, first words of this verse in light of the Hebrew. N-A is the first word, na. And it is a particle of enticement or entreaty. Now you'll rem you remember that we're talking about fish, that which pertains to a fish. And a fish is enticed by that which is shiny in the water or by uh, something on which it can feed. There is an enticement there that, that has a hook attached to it that the fish senses or the fish sees and is attracted to it. And that's the way he is snared. But he doesn't want to be snared for evil. So therefore, it says, dabar, the next word, word, D-A-B-A-R. And this means categories, or more literally, the illumined or fascinating categories or issues of your word. That which is illuminating, that which is brilliant, dazzling. I look at all these other things that the world uh, uh, um, literally hangs out before me to ensnare me, and I keep my eyes on that which is far more brilliant, far more beautiful, far more enticing and alluring, and that is the Word of God. You keep uh, uh, throwing up the, the uh, lure, and I keep grabbing for the bait, and the bait is the Word of God. So we have to understand this particular file in that per, in that law. Light. If I'm going to be enticed, if I'm going to be a Lord, if I'm going to go a certain direction, if somebody's going to have an influence on my life by dangling those things that are pretty before me, it's going to be God. Your word is fascinating. Now, he brings that from the concept of the fish into the concept of, of human existence and now says, it's your word that's the lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So, Na, the fish, is attracted to that which is the most brilliant lore, the Word of God. Now, what I'm going to do with the remainder of the time is simply go back and give you all of the categories for those who missed. There are 22 verses in the Hebrew alphabet, and Ezra uh, excuse me, tw yeah, 22 word, uh, letters in the Hebrew alphabet, and Ezra is going to take each of these and devote eight verses to it in an acrostic psalm. And he does this in order to categorize basic doctrine according to the letter and then the concept. So, Aleph, first eight verses, is an ox, and it has to do with strength of integrity for the long haul. Baith, is a house and it has to do with if a person is going to find a means whereby to uh, uh, clean up their act it has to be by learning doctrine at the house of God that's the bath file the gimel file three oh, by the way that was verses 9 through 16 the gimel file is a camel and this indicates capacity for travel this is 17 through 24, where he actually asks God to value him according to his capacity to travel through life, containing life within. The next, 25 through 32, the Daleth file. And it means here in this particular case, he's asking him to sustain him because he's entered into a condition Daleth is actually a door. He's entered into a condition through this door where he is very near to death. 
5, verses 33 through 40, is the hay file. Hay is a window, and he asks God to give him divine perspective for life. 6, this is verses 41 through 48, we have the wow, W-A-W, foul, and that is a hook that you nail to something that is stable, and it will remain there, and you can hang your hat upon it. And of course, it's talking about a stable relationship with God and His righteousness within you. Number seven is the Zayin file, Z-A-Y-I-N, 49 through 56. Zayin is the weapon. And he says, God, help me to take comfort in this weapon. Just as, and we use the illustration that is so uh, pertinent now in light of our war, of the Scud missiles and the Patriots. They can rest easier, said the news commentators, over there because the Patriot missiles fire before the Scuds get there. That's the Zayin file. The Heth file, or Keth file, 57 through 64, is an enclosure or a fence. And that means that God is his protection at this time in his life, in the midst of the bad circumstances, and is his destiny or inheritance in the future. Thou art my portion, O Lord. Kelech. From the Heth file. 9, 65 through 72 is the Teth file. And it means to maintain a favorable relationship. And God does that by making something out of something. The raw material is the doctrine in our soul, and he produces the image of Christ out of that in our lives. And we sustain our relationship with him in that, that manner. Ten is the yod file, Y or J-O-D. It is the open hand that shapes. It is also the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and it has to do with the fact that God has made us small so that we are totally dependent upon Him. Number 11, 81 through 88, is the calf file, C-A-P-H. It's the hollow or the palm of the hand, and it literally illustrates a legitimate depression. Some people are simply negative and they're out of fellowship and so they are depressed in their soul and it's because they're out of fellowship that they are hurting on the inside. There's nothing to fill them up. Now, in this case, Ezra was empty, but he said, God, I don't want to get out of fellowship and have this bout of self-pity. Fill me up with your word. And so that, of course, is the uh, calf file. Number 12. 89 through 96 is the Lamed file. L-A-M-E-D, Lamed is the ox goad. And it has to do with the fact that God's word is settled and we're going to have to face the fact that we either conformed to the word of God or rebelled against us. And this is a means by which God goads us into conformity. We are going to face that absolute standard one day. We might as well get used to it. So it conforms us. It gives us a stimulation to bring our lives in accordance with the word of God. 13, the MAIM file. The MAIM file is water, M-E-M. The next eight verses then, 97 through 104, are dedicated to this concept of using water uh, to, to bring in fresh water and to eliminate the impurities in our life. That's the main file. And then lastly, to avoid the allurements of the word, he gives eight verses, 105 to 112, to the nun file, which is the fish. How is the fish? going to escape by looking at so, uh, something that is more alluring and dazzling. And that, of course, is the fascinating, verse 105, thy word, thy dazzling word, that which gives fascinating issues, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. 